Okay, we're back and I'm here with Dr. Shervin Golian, um, master endodontist here in the San Luis Obispo uh, area. We're at Venice Beach and we're talking endodontic cases. Yes. So, uh, Shervin, why don't we talk about the, uh, this last case that you had done that you wanted to share with our audience. Uh, this is obviously a mandibular premolar, uh, a lower left premolar with a crown. Seems to have a pretty funky angulation yeah. going on. And uh, so tell us the chief complaint and how you went about treating this. Well, the chief complaint in this case was chewing sensitivity. The patient was really starting to feel tender uh, to percussion on this tooth, palpation on this tooth. And uh, obviously we did pulp testing and the pulp testing came out non-responsive with a lesion attached to the apex of uh, this mandibular premolar. And you know, this, this is one of those cases where sometimes you wonder, well, is this the, uh, the foramen overlapping the tooth? I mean, you can obviously see there's a lamina dura that's not intact, but again, it's part of your differential diagnosis to figure out whether this is actually a lesion of endodontic origin or some kind of uh, anomaly in the anatomy of the bone. So. That's a great point, Sharon, which is why we do all the pulp testing and we don't rely on the radiograph. Radiograph is only one tool among the many we have in order to make a diagnosis, and the real diagnosis has to be based on your pulp vitality test. And as you said, you did all the tests and it was negative. Therefore, you can make a differential diagnosis that explains this to be a lesion of endodontic origin rather than an anatomical one. So what, was, uh, what did you do about that? After uh, you made the diagnosis, you proceeded to take a CBCT, and what did you find out? Yeah, you know, and, and this is the, the importance of uh, what we're starting to figure out in endodontics is that you can use CBCT on any case to help you with treatment planning. And uh, in this case, it, it, it's a case where it looks like a single root on the radiograph. However, it looks like possibly there's a second root on there. So we can explore that clinically once we get inside the actual crown with a microscope. However, it's better if we can be conservative by knowing what's inside the tooth. And this is a case where the, the CBCT actually allowed us to do a very conservative access because I knew exactly where the canal is located in the tooth and we didn't really need to go in there to look for a second root. We know that it's a conical shaped root, so we're going to use our CBCT to help us with the access. And so this is the access of the crown. It's right in the center where the canal is located. It's probably a millimeter and a half. Um, it can be accomplished with, uh, with a diamond burr and using the microscope, I'm able to locate precisely where the canal is located and we can see where we didn't remove too much dentin, we didn't remove too much of the crown. Um, I don't have to go look for another canal so we don't need to make an, op an oval shaped access in this case. And here we are looking at it from Higher magnification. Higher magnification. Yeah. Yeah. So it's fairly conservative, just went straight. Now, normally, if we look at the atlases, it'll tell us to make our preparations oval because of the fact that roots are conical. So here, because of the information you gain from the CBCT, you manage to find out that you have a fairly oval canal, and you manage to make this as round as possible, conserving some tooth structure, as well as making the opening smaller in the crown. So that's terrific. And then you proceeded to uh, get your working length. Right, and, and uh, yeah, very typical. We take a radiograph. I like to be uh, a millimeter or so short of the working length just to make sure where we're located inside the tooth, and I can obviously add to my working length in this case, which, uh, which we did. So we have our, our working length, uh, and again, we're using sequence files, and I like to use uh, the Brassler race files, actually, to do my coronal flaring. So... We've removed most of the coronal tooth structure. At, at this point, we're just working with the apical third of the tooth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so once we have the apical area cleaned with the sequence files, we fit our master cone with the uh, BC gutta percha cone, take our radiograph, and make a little adjustment there to it. And here it is with the BC sealer. Um, in this case, you're doing a, a sort of a, a warm vertical here because you're using your heat source to get down to where you want the post space to be. And again, the same protocol. We make our post space, clean it out with an alcohol pellet using a Stropco air syringe, which blows a very light stream of air, or you can use paper points mm -hmm. to dry mm -hmm. the canal. And then again, we bond the post. In this case, it needed a post because the general dentist informed me that there was a lot of coronal tooth structure missing when they placed the crown. So they were worried that the crown would fall off. So we bond the post, 
put in a composite buildup and then a composite over that tiny little access that we made. And we're conserving the crown, we're conserving two structure, and I think this case is going to heal up really nicely as well. So. Yeah. Uh, in terms of post preparations in these cases, um, you know, one of the things nowadays because of the bioceramic is your filler, and it's basically a one cone obturation technique. One of the things that I end up doing is I try to measure how deep my post is going to go to. I pre fit the post in advance, and then I notch the gutta percha cone up to that length so that you just basically cement a post, uh, cement a cone, and then you turn um, the gutta percha, so you basically sever off that area of notch, so you make an automatic post space that makes it a little bit easier and quicker. Nice. So you actually make your post preparation, even if you use a post drill in a case like this, you do the post drill before obturation, and then you just notch off your cone and you sear it off at that point. That's a really, really good technique there. And yeah, Dr. Nasse is, is always coming up with with better <laughs> techniques and, and easier ways of doing this. And definitely that's... Yeah, that's, that's not about it. You should try it out and uh, uh, look forward to uh, see some of your cases using uh, that technique as well. So as usual, uh, great cases now. You've just recently started to use this uh, technology. So we'll look forward to seeing more interesting cases uh, from you using this um, uh, combination of your, you know, uh, your uh, CBCT expertise and knowledge as well as the bioceramics. So... Uh, Dr. Golian, we can uh, contact you via uh, Facebook, I would assume, and we'll put up your uh, Facebook address down there. So uh, Facebook is great. You can uh, email me with any questions. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and be happy to answer. Yeah, absolutely. And you have, um, you also, uh, like uh, many of our faculty, are very interested in teaching uh, and sharing your information, which is really a key thing and nowadays, you know, uh, sharing this information really helps everyone do better around the globe as well as the ultimate beneficiary being the patients. So um, thank you again for your time and joining me today. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you for coming to California. Absolutely. And uh, we uh, look forward to more content from you uh, moving forward. Definitely. But we will then there. I'm Ali Nissen. I was joined today by Dr. Sherman Golian, uh, endodontist in uh, San Luis Obispo, California. And we hope you found this information helpful.